As we go up a column, our radius decreases. Does it make sense for that to happen? What happens to the number of electrons as I move from cesium, the bottom of the periodic table, to hydrogen at the top? But why? What else is happening beyond radius? Electrons. Keep it as simple as possible first. Remember, we haven't officially talked about electrons yet, so I don't expect you to apply that concept yet. Our electron count goes down. And when we think back to our structure of the atom, protons were our nucleus. The electrons were outside the nucleus. The electrons are what contributed to size. So when we're looking at radius, we're really talking about the electrons. And so when we look at that column, it makes sense. Lithium has less electrons than cesium. So cesium should be bigger because it has more electrons. What about left to right? We start at lithium and go to fluorine. What happened to the atomic radius? It decreased. So we can see that. So again, we'd ask the question. Okay? Or we'd say, well, we already have an answer for the vertical axis. And if our vertical made sense, then what should happen on the horizontal? Should be the same, right? Should be the same. If for any reason it doesn't change, then our hypothesis on what we've observed is then incorrect and we have to further evaluate it. So what happens to the number of electrons as we move from lithium uh, to fluorine, if we look at the image on the slide? What was that? I didn't ask about the radius. I asked about the number of electrons. They increase. Lithium has three. Fluorine has nine. More electrons should mean? Bigger. Bigger. And what happened to the radius? It got smaller. Okay. Something is mismatching with our just more electrons means bigger. That's not true. More electrons does not mean bigger. There's some other aspect to that. And the part that we haven't discussed yet is where those electrons exist. So far, we just said they're on the outside. So if we have the theory just that they're on the outside, more electrons means bigger. Right? But if we use that same theory to explain left to right, it doesn't work. Right? So there has to be something wrong with our original theory. Electrons aren't just on the outside. There has to be some organization or structure behind them. Okay? And I think I went through and did this one too. This is something that you should copy, like memorize this trend so that when you get your periodic table on the exam, you can draw on your arrows. You don't have to memorize any trends anymore. It's there. Okay? Anytime you see a question about atomic radius, all you got to do is pull the periodic table that you have for the test, and your answer is on it. You just have to read it. Kind of make sense? Okay which gets us into the wave nature of light. Okay? Light is made up of waves. Waves are described by wavelength and by frequency. Wavelength being the distance from peak to peak. Frequency being the number of peaks found within a given time frame. Questions about that? Good, because it's all I care about. Okay, that's it. Literally it. If you move into a 151 class, they will ask you to run calculations out the yin-yang with this. We don't need to worry about calculations. All I want you to pick out of light, wavelength, is the distance between peaks. Frequency is the number of peaks within a given range. Okay? That range may be seconds. It may be milliseconds. It depends on what you're looking at. Typically, it's seconds. That's all I want you to do with it. Okay? When we move beyond that, we'll now divide our radiant light spectrum. All right, so now we get out of the mathematics and the numbers and speed of light and all that junk. And we move into just what do we have. Right? We're used to visible light. And yet when we talk about the electromagnetic spe spectrum, people tend to freak out a little bit because it says electromagnetic. And electromagnetic radiation, we freak out. Right? Visible light is electromagnetic radiation. Right? Do we necessarily need to freak out at light? Ripe for a joke, unless you're a vampire. Okay. So no, nobody's a vampire. We don't worry about light. Okay. But do we need to worry about the electromagnetic radiation? Some cases, yes. Some cases, no. 
TV and radio waves, do we really need to be concerned about those, at least according to current research? Not so much. Gamma rays and cosmic rays? Yeah. Yes. Okay. So within that spectrum, there are things of incredibly high energy that are exceedingly dangerous. There's also things of incredibly low energy that aren't that big a deal. Okay? At least in the amount of doses that we get exposed to. Light is important. Light carries energy. So, well, how could that possibly be true? Well, the light that we see, that small range, is due to your eyeball getting hit by visible light. And your eyeball causing a small molecule within it bends. Just goes click. That small bend in that molecule is what then gets translated to your brain. Hey, I see red. And that's it. If it didn't have energy, what happens to that molecule? It doesn't click. If it doesn't click, we don't see anything. Okay? So it's a simple kind of adjustment. And when we look at our visible spectrum, we've got what colors? Okay. So someone started to say it out there that I, the method is typically easy. Red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, which most people seem to memorize as Roy G. Biv, because you've got somebody's name-ish. Okay. So that kind of works. Okay. I would argue that that's wrong. What's wrong with that? The rainbow has a whole hell of a lot more colors than just those seven. Okay? The rainbow has all colors in it in a continuous fashion. We don't look at it and say, this section is only red. Okay? Where is red on the spectrum shown below? <clears throat> right here? Is all that red? Is all that red? Is all that red? Where's the line that we're all of a sudden now orange? Okay. Where was the line that showed brick red? Where was the line that showed fire engine red? Okay. All of those colors are composed within that spectrum. Why don't we refer to them? Well, because most of us are colorly challenged, and we only want to memorize seven of them and not every other variation off of it. Okay. Unless you're a clothing designer. Then you've got to worry about the Pantone colors. Yeah. So is radio, infrared, UV, and gamma, are those actual colors, or are they just... What is color? Related to... What is light? color? Do we see something? What are we seeing when we see color? Light, the visible spectrum. Visible light. Okay. What is radio? Invisible, Invisible light. Okay. Gamma, Invisible infrared. Light. Okay? It only comes down to what our bodies have actually responded to. Our resp bodies have responded to the visible light spectrum. Okay? And our bodies don't have a mechanism other than saying, ouch, I'm dead, or I don't care. Okay? For everything else. That's kind of where we're located within that. Okay. Okay? So what you might be getting at is the question up above. Red, blue, yellow, or red, green, blue, yellow, for which is higher energy? Which is really the extent I would ask you to get. Radio, infrared, UV, and gamma, meh. Don't stress about that one. Okay? But within the visible light, how can we tell which is higher energy? Okay? More energy is the... More energy is? It, it's got more wavelengths per whatever you're measuring, right? More wavelengths? Violet is at 400 nanometers. Red is at 700 nanometers. According to that, which ones? So violet would have more energy. Less energy. Okay. Wavelength is a challenging thing to mess with, okay? Because it is inversely related to energy. So instead of doing the mathematics, let's come up with another way. We step outside, and what do we encounter? The sun. The sun. And we're out in the sun, we slather stuff on ourselves because we are concerned about cancer coming from ultraviolet energy coming from the sun. What is also coming from the sun? Gamma? No radiation wouldn't be coming from the sun. Infrared. Which light am I concerned about coming from the sun? UV or infrared? Infrared. 
UV. And UV I'm concerned about because it's high in energy. And that's why it's causing cancers. It's causing mutations within your cellular structure to cause, potentially cause cancer. So which is higher in energy, UV or infrared? UV. Which light, visible light, is closer to UV? Violet or red? Violet. Violet. Which one's the higher energy? Violet. Violet. If you remember Roy G. Biv, you now know violet is higher in energy than red. Okay? That's what I want you to get out of looking at those energies. What is white? White is a combination of all lights, all color. Okay? Which is how we can get away with LED TVs or the old school, old school TVs. They have the RGBs. Uh, cathode tubes is... Our, is uh, the CR CRT, but you may have also heard of the connection RGB for red, blue, green. Mm -hmm. If you combine red, blue, and green, you end up getting white light. You might be like, really? I don't believe that. My son has this little push stroller thing that has a red, a blue, and a green light on it. And it'll flash green, go, oh, that's green. It'll flash red, it goes red, and flash blue, and it goes blue. And then it flashes all three. And yes, if you look carefully, you can detect them but the color that really makes it out and stands out is white. Okay. Really bizarre and kind of neat, but that's how your brain works. All of those light molecules trip, and it says it's red. No, it's blue. No, it's green. Ah, the result is white. How come it's different from pain? Like, when you mix all the colors together, it becomes black, but when it's white, it's white. It's coming it's down to how those different processes work. When we're looking at paint, we're looking at light impacting it and making it back out. If we're looking at color from something else, we're looking at it making it straight to our eye. So it's a slightly different process on how we visualize that, and we can discuss that after class if you'd like. It's kind of beyond the scope of this. But yeah, that one was tricky. Make sense? If we really wanted to, we could ask about radio, infrared, UV, and gamma. What I would expect you to do is look at the chart and say, oh, this one's highest energy, this one's lowest energy. It's just to become familiar with the electromagnetic spectrum and to realize, bless you, that visible light is part of it. Okay. So we don't necessarily have to freak out at electromagnetics. Necessarily. If someone fires cosmic rays at you, you should be a little upset. Okay. The reason why we talk about light comes back to what is known as the emission line spectrum. Right? So remember we had the CRTs, the cathode ray tube, where we removed all the gas and we pumped electrons into it and we saw a fluorescence or a color. Well, somebody started saying, well, if that's what happens when nothing's in it, what happens when there's a little bit of something in it? So they started adding a little bit of something. Okay? They added a little bit of hydrogen, pumped it full of volts. Okay? They added a bit, little bit of helium, pumped it full of volts to see what happened. And what ends up happening is we see varying colors. Right? You stick 22,000 volts in you, you'll see lots of colors too. Right? <laughs> but that's what's happening to our atoms. Right? They're getting super excited, and in that process, are then doing something to emit light. Right? And remember, our electromagnetic spectrum is this nice big continuous slide across, all the way across. So if I see blue light, we might look at the breakdown of that through a prism and we say, well, we see all of that light. Okay, and that's now my blue light. And yet, when we go through and do it to an atom, we don't see, say, blue light as a section of blue light. We see individual lines come out of our spectrum. So, why am I seeing lines and not this big continuous band of colors? Okay. Those lines correspond to what the atom is doing, and that atom can only respond with those individual colors. Well, the colors were dictated by a wavelength, which are ultimately dictated by an energy. So when we're looking at our atoms in this kind of system, what we're saying is that hydrogen has three energies associated with it. A violet energy, a blue-green energy, and a red energy. Not a spectrum of colors, but individual bands. A single line corresponding to one particular energy. Which seems really, really weird. Because 
if we kind of move around, what we visualize are continuous patterns. If we organized everybody by height in this room, okay, we would probably see a nice sloped line, starting with the, uh, let's start with the shortest, why not? Or shortest, up to our tallest. We wouldn't see a bunch of short people, and then nobody, and then a bunch of tall people, okay, or a bunch of taller people. We don't see populations step. They have a distinct or a, a gradual slope. Okay, so this is kind of a bizarre observation. Why do we have distinct steps and not just a continuous slope? Well, it has to do with what's happening. Remember, our whole discussion here is about electrons. The electrons are what are moving around when we're talking about the line spectrum. So what, 22,000 volts came in and said, here you go, electron, have some energy, go wherever you want. The electron just said, well, I'm going to go here, but only to this spot. I'm not going to go halfway in between. I'm only going to go to that one spot. I'm going to make that one jump. But if I give it half that energy, what does it do? Nothing. Nothing. Right? It just stays there. So you didn't give me enough energy to make the jump, so I'm not doing it. Okay, so we have these big kind of gaps that have to be bridged by our 22,000 volts. Okay? This is where Niels Bohr comes in. Bohr comes in and says, based off of this observation, electrons have to exist at energy levels. Okay? We have discrete steps within this. They can't exist anywhere around the atom. They have to exist at these particular orbits. Okay? The word he used to describe this is quantized. Quantized just means defined, okay? or a numeric defined, which we later go through to do is for quantum mechanics. Okay? It's mechanics that doesn't have continuous descriptions. They have steps associated with it. Okay? This is where what you may have seen in elementary school, right? where they say, oh, you've got the nucleus, and then you have these rings around it which is awesome and cool, and about half right. Okay? It doesn't fully describe what's going on, but it does a pretty good job of approaching the subject. Okay? And that's usually where we leave it with elementary, middle, or maybe high school. I actually don't know what high school teaches. Hopefully they teach more than this. Okay? What we're talking about is our quantum concept. So again, if we look at examples, a ramp is continuous. If I put a ball on a ramp, it can exist in contact with the ramp at all places on the ramp. If I put that ball on steps, it can't exist at half a step because there's nothing there. It has to exist at those individual steps. That's our quantized phenomenon. If we go back to our Bohr model, what's happening is he went through... And we have seven discrete energy levels, which is kind of hard to see on it, but it is there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay. Could there be more? Theoretically, yes. Okay. But we do reach a maximum. Okay. Somewhere up about this point, what happens? It's too far away. Right? It's too far away from the nucleus, and it just falls away. You can, I can take this pen from the center of my chest and slowly move it outwards, and eventually it gets so far away from me that what happens? I can't hold on to it anymore. It falls out of my reach. Same thing's happening with our electrons. They get too far away from the nucleus, and they disappear off the side of the atom. That space gets known as the vacuum... Looks like I spelled that right. No. It's our vacuum. Okay. And that is our theoretical maximum. So yes, I could drop in 8, 9, and 10, but 8, 9, and 10 all have to exist between the space of 7 and the vacuum. The instant I hit that vacuum line, where do I go? No longer attached. So we start to kind of reach a, a limit in being able to put things in because now they start to get too close to each other. Okay. 
So what's happening within this? So if we looked at hydrogen, hydrogen's first electron is going to exist at which of those energy levels? One, two, three, four, five, six, or seven? Why would it go to one? I only have one pen. Couldn't I hold it really close or versus really far away? Okay. Why would it be held close and not far away? Because it's got to fill the first sublevel first. Why? You're giving me a rule, but I don't understand the rule. Charge is bad. Finger electrical outlet, not good. Okay. That's exceptionally high energy. So what happens with our electron? The electron wants to be canceled out. We want that charge neutralized. To get neutralized, where does it need to be? As close as it possibly can to the proton. Okay? So it's going to go to its lowest energy set. That's one. That's why we fill there. Okay? So there's hydrogen just chilling here. But notice all the arrows. They're even co corresponding those to the colored lines. What are they referencing with those arrows? The energy level of something moving from, for violet, what is that, the fifth to the second energy level. Right? For the blue-green, fourth to the second. For red, third to the second. We're referencing what moving? The electron. The electron. Where's hydrogen's electron? In one. In the first energy level. That atomic line spectrum with the purple, the green, and the red is, guess what? No. Hydrogen. Nope. Perfectly valid. Why? What happened? When we look at hydrogen, it's a gas, right? Hydrogen is in this room right now. How many of you see those colors in the air? Don't be like, it's on that shirt. <laughs> you don't see it. Why not? What was the part that was missing in this discussion? 22,000 volts. 22, volts. Okay. I have to stick a cattle prod behind hydrogen. That cattle prod gives the electron a bunch of energy. Some of the times, that energy will be enough that it jumps to the second energy level. When it's at the second energy level, is that high in energy? Think relative. If all of a sudden you're sitting here and all of a sudden you were moved five feet in the air, Okay. You would not be particularly happy about that. Okay. Yes, that's higher, higher than the first level. What does that electron then do? Jump back to the first, Jump level. Back to the first level. What happened to the energy loss there? So there's an interesting theory. Two to one, you said, gives me a color. Atomic line spectrum for hydrogen. Do we see a color that's not explained already? No. What is that two to one gap in energy? Or maybe said another way, what is that gap in two to one energy not? Light emitting? I don't accept light, but you're right there. I want a different word. Different word in front of light. With a V. Visible. Visible light. Yes, there's an energy jump there that corresponds to a match in energy outside of the visible spectrum, which means we don't see it. Some of the time it jumped to the second energy, some of the time it jumps to the third. It depends on that exact impact for the electron moving up. Let's say it moves up to the third. Now what happens? Oh crap, I'm really high in energy. I want to go back down. What happens if it jumps from three to one? It's not nothing. No visible energy is emitted. Okay. What if it jumps from three to two? That gap in energy happens to match the energy for red light. Now we can see the electron making that jump, or see the evidence of the electron having made that jump. Why is it coming from three to one if it wants to go back to one? Three to one, good point. When we're going downstairs, do we only take one step at a time? No. No, we have the potential to take two steps at a time, or three steps at a time. Or if you've got really long legs and kind of gutsy, six or seven steps at a time. Okay. 
We have the ability to make all of those jumps. The electron does as well. So when we're pumping in those 22,000 volts, we tend to think in like very small quantities. There's only one hydrogen atom if there's only one electron. That means I wouldn't see very much light. It's not one hydrogen atom. It's billions, trillions of hydrogen atoms. All of them are going through with 22,000 volts. The instant that light's emitted, we now have a new hydrogen atom that can get excited again by another set of 22,000 volts. Okay? So there's a large sample. When we look across that entire population, we see the sum total provided up there. Okay? You can't just play with one atom. We don't have the ability to play with one atom. Yeah. What you're actually seeing would be like what you call, what, what I would call an arc. So there's an interesting idea, which was brought up in one of the other classes. Lightning. What color do you see when you see lightning? White light. Okay. Maybe blue, sometimes a little bit of purple, depending on what you're looking at. Why is it that color? It's a combination of all the colors. It's not a combination of all the colors. What's happening with lightning? We have high energy electrons and a low energy spot that doesn't have any electrons. What do those electrons say? Neutralize me. Let's move over there. Come on, team. Let's move. What are they impacting as they move through that air with those 22,000 volts? Oxygen. Nitrogen. They're impacting elements that we have in our air. What if the element primarily in our air was neon or argon? We would see a different color light. Lightning bolt is 22,000 volt, volts, okay? It is that cattle prod to our element. The reason we're seeing that color is because we're seeing the atomic line spectrum in sum total for all of the elements along that bolt or that arc. If you're talking about arcing when you weld, presumably is where you're going with that, the same colors that you see there, if you change the gases you're working with, what happens? You'll change the color of that spark or that arc. Right? And it's all corresponding to electrons jumping between orbitals. Neat. It's a very specific piece of energy that gets it up to 2, 3, and 4. And again, very specific, but it goes from 4 to 3 and 4 to 2. Yes. Very specific. Okay. So specific that we're looking at 1 nanometer. Um, if, we, if we can't see the, the dropping from 2 to 1, could that be like infrared? So that's an interesting idea. What would you guess that to be? Okay, remember, red was 3 to 2. What would you guess the gap is, the color, between 2 to 1? Would it be more red or less red? Okay. Red is this jump. Blue-green was 4 to 2. Oh, let's see if I can do this. Right? That red jump is what? Smaller or larger than the 4 to 2? Smaller, which means the energy is less. Smaller jump means less energy. So we see red. When we look at the 2 to 1 jump, that's a bigger jump, which means should we be going more red or more blue? More blue for the 2 to 1 jump. And just in case you decide to do this, if I look at that and then do something like that, oh, those look really close. Why am I not seeing something? This is not to scale. Okay. We get approximations, but that's it, not to scale. Does that work? Other questions on this? Atomic fingerprints. Depending on the element we hit these 22,000 volts with, we're going to see different things. When I move from hydrogen to helium, take a look at helium. Helium, there should be seven lines. One, two, three, four, five, six, I lied, eight, seven, eight lines for helium. Why do we have eight lines for helium but only three for hydrogen? There's more electrons. Move to lithium. One, two, three, four. Not a bad theory, but I disagree. It has to do with the electrons, not even necessarily in the outer field of the atom, but that's going to be part of it. What happens if I move from hydrogen to helium? What have I done? 
I gained a proton. That proton is now going to have a stronger positive force than for hydrogen, which means what happens to the first electron? It loses energy. It's going to be change its energy minimally. Okay, we would probably expect to get a little bit closer to the nucleus, which means the energy level has changed just by adding a proton. What else have I added when I go to helium? Fair enough, we added a neutron. That's also going to change the energy. What else have I added? Neutral helium. Let's see, we had a proton, we added a neutron. And he's saying there's something else that was added. Electron. electron. What happens when the electron gets near another electron? They're going to repel each other, similar charges, just like with our protons needing neutrons. So the energy level, as soon as we even move up one atom, all of the energy levels change. If all of the energy levels change, what does that mean happens to all the gaps? They also all change, which is why when we look at our atomic line spectrum or our atomic fingerprints, we're going to get varying results across the board. But this is one of the things that's neat about it, because we're only looking at a single wavelength out of a possible 400-ish. We've got a lot of individual codes that we can use. That's why we call them fingerprints. Okay. Is there a consistent and predictable pattern between them, or it's different? Depends who you talk to. <laughs> To get your consistent pattern, you have to go into the quantum mechanics behind defining each of those energies and being able to say, for this atom, it is this energy. We don't have very good ability. I believe when we're looking at the quantum scale of those energies, we're probably up to about boron. Once we hit boron, maybe, and I think that's even a stretch. Right? To go even to carbon, to explain the energy levels within carbon, we're looking at a supercomputer cranking for days to come up with the calculations to figure out where all those things are. The instant you add an electron or a proton or a neutron, everything changes. So the models that we currently work with are with hydrogen, and only hydrogen, because hydrogen's simplest. So even with that model, we'll say, well, when we add in a second electron, it's going to go to this place, because that's where we'd expect it to go if it was hydrogen. But does hydrogen get a second electron, or a third, or a fourth, or heaven forbid, an extra 117? No but we're using hydrogen as our model to explain it, and when we go back and look at the actual real-world results, what happens? It works, so we stick with our theory. So different isotopes also give different line spectrums, right? Different isotopes have the potential to give different line spectrums because of the different neutrons. That I'm not sure about. Um, for sure, different protons and electrons are gonna change it. Neutrons don't have a charge. So I don't know how they would affect your line spectrum. I would guess not, or minimally. What could we do with this? I want to know if Jupiter has water. So I'm going to build a rocket ship. I'm going to put somebody in that rocket ship. I'm going to fly them to Jupiter. I'm going to make them get out of that rocket ship. I'm going to make them dig in the ground until they find water. That seems like a really bad idea. Right. What can we do instead? Aim a telescope at Jupiter. And in that telescope, have it dissect the atomic line spectrum of the light making it back to us. We can then determine what elements were present there. And from that, we can start to make approximations on whether water would be likely present or not. Right. Space exploration is looking a lot at atomic line spectrum. If you have to take an astronomy class, do so, they'll look at atomic line spectra. Okay? So, <sighs> let's move to electron homes, because this is the fun part. Okay? Sort of sarcastically. Bohr discovered these main energy levels, and we have others. So we end up with seven potential energy spectrums. So I've got a whole bunch shown up here. I don't remember if I counted it well. Let's count it out. Let's call the first one. What do we want to name the first one? One, you are super creative, <laughs> and believe it or not, you are so creative, just like every other chemist that went through and did this. The first energy level is called one. The second one? Two. Two, wow. At least one. Three, four, five, six, and seventh. That last line that I have drawn there is? Our vacuum. 
It has been removed from the atom. Okay, what is at the bottom? Our nucleus, which ideally is a lot further down, but I can't do that. So if we describe our diagram, and I'm going through all this trouble to draw all this, and it's just going to get deleted in a second. As we move further up, away from the nucleus, what happens to our energy? Okay. Our energy for that electron gets less because it's at a higher energy state. Okay. Depends on how we're doing our comparison. So our energy increases. The first energy level is the lowest energy level. The seventh energy level is our highest energy level. Okay. So there we go. Bohr's model says we got the seven energy levels. What needs to go into each orbit? Electrons. So let's put in an electron. Where would I expect that first electron to go? The first energy level. I want to go to the lowest energy possible. Where's the next electron go? Okay, I'm hearing someone say the first energy level. Okay, anybody want to challenge that? Or do you want me to do it first? Okay, I'm going to challenge it. Electrons, same charge. What happens when the same charge gets near each other? They repel. They repel. They'll be on the sides of the uh, orbit. Okay. There's a little weird thing that comes out of solving for our electron orbitals. It's known as the electron spin. Okay. Our electrons have a spin associated with them. So when I'm looking at my electrons, I have the potential to put two electrons in an orbital because they spin the opposite direction. That means there's two spin states. Where's the third electron go? It has to move up in energy. I will only move up in energy when I've satisfied my lowest energy set. Where's the next electron go? Two. 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 To move up in energy, I'd have to go to the third. That's higher in energy. I'm going to keep it in the second. Where's my uh, five? Fifth. Fifth. Okay, I'm hearing a three. You all read everything. Okay, so we might say it should go into the second, but what's the problem with going into the second? I'm going to have a repulsion. Those are going into the same space, so they would have to go to the third. I agree with the third statement. What's the problem that we're now going to predict coming out of this in a second? We're going to run out of room. 118 electrons for an unoctium. Okay. That's a bit problematic because in this theory, I can get a whopping total of 14. So there's something wrong with the theory. Okay? Well, Bohr, in the process of going through and doing this, elaborated further before someone got to this point. But when we played around with the mathematics, what we noticed is that as we moved up in energy, we added an extra section for that energy. Okay? That would be like starting at the bottom down here. We have X number, or starting here, we have X number of seats. When I move up to the tier behind it, Notice there's more seats. Why are there more seats? There's more space. Okay. Something has changed. So as we move further away, we end up dividing that second energy level across different systems. Every time we step up, we increase the ability. Whoa, come back here. We increase that division. So when we move up to the second, I now have two divisions. When I move up to the third, what happens? I'm now going to have three divisions. Okay, there's what that says. When I move up to the fourth, fifth, five divisions, six, six, and seven, seven, seven divisions. Okay, so they will continuously divide out as we go through and do that. Where did that come from? That's part of the probability of finding where an electron is located. Someone went through and said, well, this is how, roughly how I know it moves. This is what happens when I solve for its location. These things fall out of those mathematics. Anybody really good at math? OK, then take my word for it. If we divide this all the way out, we are still not going to hit 118. Yeah. Okay. So what's wrong? Does the subdivision sound like subdivisions? Our subdivisions now have subdivisions. subdivisions. Okay. 
So we've got an orbital type that comes in as we move up. Okay, so let's start at the first energy level. The orbital type is described as a sphere. So there's my circle explaining that. The second energy level, up now at blue, I repeat the type that I had at the first energy level. So the first one will be a sphere. The second one will be? Okay. I can't move to a sphere because I already have a sphere. It's got to be something else. Let's say smaller sphere. If it's a smaller sphere, it overlaps with the other orbital, the s orbital, or the, sorry, the one sphere. Crap. Okay. So it can't be a smaller sphere. If it was a larger sphere, it's then going to overlap with the third energy type. So what ends up happening? We get a new orbital type. Which sometimes people refer to as an infinity. I would argue that's kind of looking at it sideways, but fair enough. Okay. Typically better described as a dumbbell. Okay. The shape is more accurately drawn as two fists sitting on top of each other. Okay. That's a more accurate representation. It's hard to draw two fists on top of each other, so I draw a figure eight. Okay. When we move up to the third, what happens? I get the sphere, I get another dumbbell, and I get that shaped ballpark. Okay. So, everybody happy with calling these sphere, dumbbell, and clover? Well, you guys are no fun. Most people don't want to write all that out. Uh, actually, because you guys were excited about it, we'll make you write it all out. Okay. So sphere, dumbbell, and clover. Let's take a look at that dumbbell okay, and compare it back to the sphere. So we're going to start just looking at the second energy level. If I take that sphere and I rotate it, can you tell it rotated? No. Which means when I look at the sphere type, there's only one possible orientation for that sphere. That's it. Well, what about the dumbbell? If I rotate it, can you tell me that it was rotated? Yeah. yeah. So it turns out the dumbbell splits into three what are known as degenerate states. Okay. We have one on the y-axis, one on the x-axis, and then one on the z-axis coming in and out of that board at you. So those three degenerate orbitals. Okay. So that means when I move up to the dumbbell shape, I have three orbitals. We now have enough to work with our electron configurations. So let's start with that. Hydrogen. What would the electron configuration for hydrogen be? Well, how many electrons does it have? One. One. Okay. So one electron. I want to now describe the location of that one electron. Okay. Where is it located? Okay. It should be located in the lowest energy possible. So I'll place it in the one energy level. That energy level also happens to be shaped like a sphere. So I will call it one sphere. Okay. If I now want to define that there is a single electron located in that spot, I now have a notation that we've talked about previously to define where that electron is. What is located in the upper left hand in our atomic notation? And looking at the periodic table is a bad place to look. Atomic notation, or nuclear notation. We said in the upper left-hand corner of our symbol, what is specified there? The atomic mass. The lower left-hand corner was the atomic number. The atomic number was our number of protons. The atomic mass was protons and neutrons. Where were the electrons specified? Well, not in the upper left, not in the upper, lower left, upper right-hand corner. That's where we'll specify our electrons. How many electrons are there for hydrogen? One. So I will specify one sphere, upper right-hand corner, one. Okay. Because you all look bored. Lithium. Give me the notation for lithium, please. Electron configuration. 
What's that? Three. Three is not an electron, or an electron configuration. The configuration tells me where the electrons are located. I know lithium has three electrons. Where are those three electrons located? Okay. Two in the first doesn't count. Not specific enough. One S, one, two, S, two. I have no idea what S is because you guys said you were okay writing sphere. Sphere. One sphere, one, two, sphere, two. One sphere. One. One sphere. What? Two sphere. One. You're already looking at that saying, wait, what could I simplify? What's that? We aren't even there yet. I have two one spheres that are the same. So let's combine them. By combining them, what happens to the number of electrons? It increases, it'll go up to two. So I can call this one sphere two, two sphere one. Does everybody understand that notation? Should we really push this? It could be better. Aluminum. Provide the electron configuration for aluminum. There's only 13 electrons for that. I could have been a bigger jerk and gone all the way to say, I don't know, tellurium, 52. Use the notation that you guys have said was okay to do aluminum. Uh, this, might take a while. this might take a while. Why? I'll be writing sphere a lot. You're going to be writing dumbbell a lot. Maybe we don't like the terms sphere and dumbbell. Maybe we want an abbreviation, a simplification. Agreed. Agreed. Thank you. What can we simplify sphere to be? S. S. When we move up to the second energy level, that first one is still a sphere. What should I call that one? Sphere two. Two S's. It's still an S. If I want to specify that it's the second energy level, what can I say? 2s. 2s, energy level, followed by the type of orbital. Right. When I move up to the next one with our dumbbells, 2p. Right. Why did we pick the letter p? What? <laughs> were, were you actually like in my brain there for a second? Because that's what I was going to say. Is it actually Latin for dumbbell? It would, not dumbbell, but you're on the right track because it said so in the book. Oh, I was saying that to make it up. <laughs> it's, it's Latin for the shape that you're referring to. Oh, well, that's cool. Look at that. You learn something new every day. The symbols are ultimately irrelevant. Okay? You just need to know what they are and what they match to. So they do Latin for cloverleaf, too? Because what's the symbol for cl cloverleaf? D. One of those kind of like useless facts things. Yeah, it was, oh, that's cool. That's neat. Well, there we go. We got something new. They have an origin. We don't care about the origin. We want the names, our symbols. So if we move to aluminum, what is our configuration? Let's work our way through it. Aluminum has how many electrons? 13. 13. The first electron goes into the first energy level, S. The second electron goes in, first energy level, S. For those who are saying, do you really have to write it out that way? No, we'll simplify it in a little bit. Next electron, 2S. Next electron, next electron. Did I really pick aluminum? Okay, I'm not going to ask anymore. Oh, this, okay, we're, we're, sh we're shortening this fast. One, two, three, four, five. Okay, really irritating to write each and every single one of them out. So if they're in the same site, condense. 1s2, 2s2, 2p6. Does everybody see where those are coming from? We're looking at the periodic table, we're just moving element by element, okay, adding an electron in each time. We move up to 3s2, 3p1. 
And there's our electron configuration for aluminum. Kind of makes sense? So if we go through and do enough of these, what are we going to start to notice? Any element in the first two columns will get referred to as S. Their outermost electron goes into the S orbital, which means those first two columns get known as the S block. Any element within those is S electrons. Between boron to neon, that whole section on the far right, how many columns was that? Six, because... One, two, three, four, five, six. The p-type orbitals, plural, hold six electrons. Each orbital holds two, three orientations, three times two, six. So the periodic table stashes that information for us. Scandium to zinc, known as the D-block. The bottom row, two rows. That's the F-block. So our periodic table has those blocks subdivided according to the electron homes. And does the D block move up one? We'll talk about that. What happens as we continue to fill? Let's move aluminum to argon. What changes? Move up to what, 18 electrons? Okay. So as I continue to add those electrons out, I'm going to end up with 3p6. Okay. So let's address a couple things. Uh, where are we? Argon? Argon is in which row? Argon's in the first row. Rows are horizontal axis. Argon's located in the third row. The last orbital filled is what energy level? That's not an energy level. Six is the number of electrons. Three. Okay. Argon is in the P block. The last orbital filled is a P orbital. It's in the sixth column of the P block. Six electrons go in. The periodic table is a massive version of battleship. Okay. You're identifying your electron configurations by labeling things off of it. Everything before that has to fill. Right? If we go back and look at our diagram, because we now moved to the next orbital, right? We are S, 1S, or 2S, or 2P, or 3S, or 3P. What should the next orbital be? So I'm not looking for the answer. What would you predict it to be? And I'll show four in black. Again, not to scale, but we're close. When I put the next electron in, I heard a suggestion for 4S. So instead of filling the third energy level, I'm going to jump to the fourth energy level. So we're really like, yeah, that makes perfect sense to me. First electron went into what orbital or what energy level? The lowest. The lowest was the number associated with it. When I move up to argon, the very next electron, should that go into the 3D or the 4S? 3D. Okay. According to our patterns, where would we expect it to go? 3D. The 3D, because the 3D is lower in energy than 4. Third energy, fourth energy. Everybody make, understand that. Okay. So that was our theory. There was a suggestion that it goes into the 4S. Well, how would I know? I wish I had this giant table of elements that tells me the order in which they fill. Oh, wait, I do. I add one more electron after argon, and I become what element? Potassium. Potassium is found in which row? Fourth row. In which block? One doesn't count as a block. S. S. The next electron will fill the 4S before it for, fills the 3D. You might be like, well, why does that happen? That's a weird exception. Okay, there's two answers to that. One, you can call it a weird exception. Crap, I have to memorize it. No, you don't. The periodic table gave it to you. 
It told you that's where it goes. That's our organization. Or two, we look at the possibilities on what's happening here. Take a look at our D. The D has five orientations. One, two, three, four, five. So I can either place one electron into the 4S, or I can place one electron into the 3D. Those are the two options that we're looking at right here, right? Okay. Mind-blowing time, at least in my mind. It destroys my mind. Okay. Close your eyes, because for this example, I really don't want you looking at me. It's creepy enough. Okay. We ready? I still see people looking at me. At least don't look at me if you're going to keep your eyes open. Are okay, you ready for the example? Envision the most attractive person you know. <laughs> See, that's why I didn't want you looking at me. Because <laughs> here's the next part of it. Cover up half of their face. They become the video. And then cover up the other half of their face. What you will likely notice is that their face is darn close to perfectly symmetric. Okay. And for those of you saying, well, that's not true. I don't believe this. Check the internet, man. The internet never lies. <laughs> Look at the people that we've decided to be classically beautiful and cover half their face, cover the other half of the face. You can even do it with some kind of, some people will actually show the animation of it, where they take half the face, they mirror it, and they remove the mirror. And you're like, holy crap, it's the exact same. There is no difference. There are pseudo exceptions to this. The only one that I know really quickly off the top of my head would be something like Cindy Crawford, which I know ancient, but whatever. At least two or three people in here will get the reference. Okay? Was considered, yeah, who is the fun question. She's considered attractive. Okay? But you'll be like, she's asymmetric with that mole. Remove the mole. Perfect mirror image. Like literally perfect mirror image. Put the mole back. It's the one thing that makes her asymmetric. It's the one thing that just kind of makes her not quite perfect, that now she becomes perfect. Okay. <laughs> Symmetry applies back to this. Which is more symmetrical? One orbital with one electron or five orbitals with one electron? One orbital, one orbital with one electron. Chemistry favors symmetry as well. It will fill the 4S before it fills the 3D. Why did it not do it, say, with the two P's? Why did I fill the two P before the three S? Remember, as we move up in energy or move up in our orbital types, the energy gaps get smaller and smaller and smaller. When we're looking at the two P to the three S, there's still a large gap in energy. When I look at the three D in comparison to the four S, that energy difference is minuscule. Now symmetry can have an effect. Symmetry is a very, very small, minute contribution to how we fill orbitals. It just so happens to come up once we hit that third to fourth energy transition. That's where it's happening. Okay. So after potassium, calcium, also in the S block, so we fill the S orbital, 4S2. We then move to scandium. We add one more electron. That one more electron is now going to move to the 3D and not the 4P. Why? It's not symmetry anymore. They're both asymmetrical. Lower energy. The energy gap has now gotten enough that we'll fill the 3D before we fill the 4P. Yeah, I said that right. Okay. So scandium's electron is located in the 3D orbital. What did that do to our map now on the periodic table? Where is scandium located? Which row? Fourth row, which means we would predict its last electron to go into which orbital or which energy level? The fourth. And yet where does it go? The three. It goes into the three D orbitals. Okay. Why did we not put scandium up on the third energy level right next to argon? The electrons wouldn't match out. We'd go from argon to scandium. That doesn't make any sense. Okay. Just organization on the periodic table. The energies are now already defined by those elements. Why is scandium not offset and put up at the third energy level? If I put scandium just up one row, it would go magnesium to scandium. Well, that sucks. 
That doesn't even make sense. 12 to 21? Why did we offset the transition elements? How many of you want to memorize the fill pattern? Oh, nobody. Guess what? No other chemist did either. What they decided to do was memorize that the transition elements are offset by one. Now the periodic table has the fill pattern built into it. Okay. What happens with the lanthanides and actinides? It's a little bit harder. The lanthanides are offset by two. They're offset by one because of the transition elements, and they're offset by a further one because the new orbital type. Okay. How many problems are you going to see where you fill the F orbitals? How many problems do you want to see where you fill the F orbitals? Zero. Zero. Okay, good. I don't want to ask those questions either. Okay. That's a long electron configuration. Yes, for those of you saying, isn't there a shortcut notation? Yes, you can read the book on it. I'm not going to talk about it. We can use the noble gases as a notational shortcut. Okay. So what we get out of this is then just locations. And everybody says, well, this is way too hard. I can't believe this. Why would we ever do this in chemistry? How do you tell people to get to your house? It's a grid. So number one, it's a grid system here. And in Phoenix, it's also a grid system for locations of house. It's really easy to find. It's like someone planned the city. Shocking. It's like someone planned the periodic table. Yeah, we went through and designed things to fit certain systems to make it easier to navigate. If you look at where you live, you might tell them your address, the number, like an electron spin. You might tell them the street, your orbital orientation. You might tell them the town, orbital type. You might tell them the country, energy level. It's the same type of process that you use to describe where you live. Okay? There are some kind of oddities because, well, you can have more than two people live in your house most of the time. That was supposed to be funny. Like people fight. Uh, you guys are horrible. Orbital types. Okay? The shapes that are associated with these are what are known as probability types or probabilities. There's a 95% probability that when I look at an electron in the 3s energy level, it is located within that sphere. That means there is also a percent or a probability that I will find the electron outside that sphere. Perfectly allowed. Okay? Just 95% of the time it's there. That gives me the shape associated with it. Okay? That's where those are coming from. When I move to the 2p, energy type and orbital, or energy level and orbital type, I get a 95% probability of finding it in that dumbbell shape. Same deal, excuse me, with the cloverleaf. So our sphere, one orientation. So we only get one orbital. With the dumbbell, because it's located, or we can tell if it's rotated, that means we get more orbital types. We get three orientations. Those three orientations fall on the x, y, and z axes. Okay. Where's the x axis? Straight across. Where is it now? See, this is why you attend class. You can see me doing weird, goofy things with my body. Or if I could stand on my head, where did it go? Okay. Or if I turn that way, where does it go? The x axis will always change depending on the observer. I always, that's why in physics, when you try and solve problems, they're like, just say this is your coordinate axis system because it's easier to solve. You define it. Same thing's happening with orbitals. Okay. Why does that become kind of tricky for people to get? Because when we look at these, we call it 2px because it's located on the x axis. 2py because it's located on the y axis, z. Do we care about the x, y, and z? No, because if we change our view, it becomes a different orbital be it px, py, or pz. The important part is to recognize there's three of them, and once we've established an axis coordinate plane, they're on the axes. Which takes us to the d orbitals. Come on. Cloverleaf. Okay. Where is the cloverleaf located? Really hard to see in a two-dimensional drawing. Guess where it is not located? On the x, y, and z axes. Why not? 
they would overlap the same space as another orbital. They have to be outside that orbital realm. So we've got five orientations for our clover leaf. And everybody hasn't, doesn't have any questions about that being a clover leaf, right? Looks good. That, that really doesn't look like clover leaf. That is not looking at it end on. That is a dumbbell with a donut. Well, that's totally what it is. What's that mean? Okay. Why are we still calling that a clover leaf? Because we can't. Show we that. can't really because we don't have another orientation. It turns out that when we move to that energy level and that orbital type, that we get a new shape coming out of it. Okay. Three shape names that you are responsible for. The first will be sphere, known as S. The next one will be P. What's our shape name? Dumbbell. Dumbbell. Last one, D, our cloverleaf. You don't need to stress about the donut dumbbell. What about the fifth energy level? It gets even more complex. Again, we don't care for the sake of this class. Okay. So let's take a look at our orbital capacity and spin. For the first energy level, I have number one and then the type. Because I'm at the first energy level, I only have one type. That is the S. How many electrons can fit in that? Two. Two. Good. That worked. Sorry, I thought I was hitting a different button. How many electrons go into that energy level? Two. What happens when I move to the second energy level? I will have the 2s and I will have the 2p. How many electrons fit in the 2s? Two. Two. How many electrons fit in 1, 2p? Six. I'm hearing six is a good shout out for an answer. It is technically wrong because you didn't answer the question that was asked. How many electrons fit in 1, 2p orbital? Two. How many electrons fit in the 2p orbitals? Six. Every orbital can only hold two electrons. Why does the 2p appear to hold more electrons? There's three, There's three orientations. I get three orbitals. So be careful when you answer a question. Look for the quantity of these. How many electrons in the second energy level? So I heard six because there's a six there. The second energy level is anything with a 2 in front. 8. Okay. We could go through and do this for the S. Whoa. The S and the P. Your textbook has those listed out. You're just stepping through those so that you can see them total up. Okay. This picture kind of shows everything fill out. We already looked at the electron configuration, so I'm not going to go through that again. Our electrons will always add to our orbital homes. I'm not done. <laughs> Lowest energy for first, and we will pair before moving up to a new home. Okay. Come on. This is our filling diagram. You might see this. If you know how to cross stitch, I'm going to guess it's cross stitching. You move through and you double back. You move through and you double back. This is an attempt at saying you can memorize how to fill your electrons. Or... Use the periodic table. That <laughs> is an entirely unnecessary thing to look at. I'll talk to you after class. The important part I want to address here is this concept of valence electrons. What are our valence electrons? The outermost layer doesn't work because I don't know what layer means. The valence electrons are dictating chemical properties. Those are the electrons we would expect to interact with somebody else. When we talked or we first introduced, you might go through and shake someone's hand. Why don't you reach in and feel what their heart feels like? That's probably a better presentation of them, like, whoop. What? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 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 
I just like That's the, not going to look great because it's not recorded visually. All you hear is sound. But now it's stuck in our head. Yeah. So, <laughs> you aren't going to reach out. Why would you not do that? And don't tell me societal conventions. Okay. You're only going to go after what's closest. So to a first approximation, your valence electrons are more accessible. We're going to look at the valence electrons. Which electrons are your outermost? Which electrons are your outermost electrons? The ones furthest away? Okay, that's partially correct, but still wrong. Nope, that's pretty much the same thing as furthest away. So if I gave, let's do carbon real quickly. With the greatest amount of energy? 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Uh, two. Which electrons are the valence electrons? 2p2. I'm here in 2p2. Unfortunately, that answer is wrong. That might explain why you got some of the questions wrong in the Lewis video. <coughs> it is the highest energy level. 2s, 2p1, and 2p2. There are four valence electrons for carbon. It is the highest energy level. Right? There's weird exceptions when you move up to the third energy level because that brings in the d orbitals. We'll ignore the d orbitals. Okay? And with that, I'll end 30 seconds late because you packed early.